Should I add sugar to my pasta sauce? Um, if you want to. Uh, I assume you're talking about tomato sauce. And yeah, I mean, every tomato is different. Every kind of can of tomatoes is different. And some, it's an agricultural product. Like some might be more sweet, some might be less sweet. Um, some might be less sweet because you simply haven't cooked them for very long to concentrate the sugars, right? So like you should get for like the sweet and sour balance that you want. And for some reason there's this attitude that like cooking with sugar, cooking savory food with sugar is somehow invalid, which is just bizarre because if a food is not acidic enough, you put vinegar in it or lime juice or basically just, it's, you know, just pure acid is what you're putting in there. If something isn't naturally salty enough, you put salt in it. If something isn't naturally sweet enough, you put sugar in it and that's just as fine. What's wrong with that? You said hit me with a quick question. <laughs> that was, <laughs> here we go. And cold open. Ask Adam. Hi, welcome to Ask Adam episode four. We will take a few of your questions, which we uh, accepted on Instagram again this time. Instagram just seems to be a positive place and I appreciate that. Um, so my lovely wife, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even had a drink of this yet. Oh my my lovely wife, Lauren, is off camera and will be uh, putting some, selecting some of your questions and putting them to me. This is my first drop of alcohol in a week because I got back some bad blood work and so I've had to significantly curtail my drinking. Um, okay, not, don't freak everyone out. It's not bad blood work. No, 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 it's no, just no. like, just if like, you want to be a healthier human, you yeah, should do Yeah, like these you things. shouldn't have super high triglycerides, right? Like that's a sort of an early warning sign that your, your diet is really hurting, could potentially really hurt you. So anyways, it just sucks because like this happened right when I remembered how much I like fine scotch whiskey. Um, cause it's like, so, you know, we, we took our honeymoon in Scotland mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of honey, people's honeymoons are nice. But ours was awesome. Like it was, it it was, was really so good. much fun. <laughs> so we spent most of the time in Glasgow, and you know. Anyway, so like you know, having having a, a, a wee drop of the creature, like uh, you know, brings me back there in ways that are really fun. I mean, like so we we met this this banker. What was his name? God. Derek. Derek. No, Derek was the. Um, no. Derek was the banker mm -hmm. with the BMW. No, that was a different guy. Oh, okay. Um, Roger? Was his name Roger? Roger? Let's go with Roger. So Roger um, was this just, you know, well-to-do older fellow that we happened to fall in with. And he took us to his, it was a golf club? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a golf club where he and some of his other sort of retired, distinguished Scotchman uh, friends were going to uh, have a whiskey tasting. Uh, and a young man, a salesman from a whiskey company had come to you know, uh, talk about the wares and and let the gentleman sample them. He was them. like nineteen. It maybe. must have been his first night on the job. <laughs> and these were okay. There was a re a retired banker, a retired doctor, a retired undertaker, and a retired whiskey maker. I bet this kid would have been happy for the undertaker to uh, come back into. Uh, his line of work for that evening and they just take him away. They basically like heckled him away and then got yeah. all the bottles. And, <laughs> and just started drinking them. Yeah. This kid, he like had like, like I mean, this was, what year did it be? 2007, right? So like, yes. this was kind of at the tail end of this, but he had kind of like frosted tips. He did and real spiky, real yeah. spiked up hair with and, like um, lots of crispy gel. <laughs> all the, all the, all the stylish young men in Glasgow at the time were wearing these, um, Really, really wide ties with like a double, double um, Windsor knot, yeah. and uh, and he, man, he really he just had very bright colors too because yeah. Glasgow is very gray, and um, yeah, like he boy he, yeah he didn't know what he was into uh, coming into. That, that was, was a fun night. That was a fun night. Anyway, so and the guys like I think they thought the the whiskey was shite, so. They uh, they sent us home with like all the bottles. We yeah we which, did in our suitcases. Yeah, and we were able to get that through customs somehow. I don't know. We I'm, we didn't know if we were. We yeah. just there were like opened half drunk bottles of whiskey. So anyway, I mean like Scotch whiskey is is just intrinsically wonderful stuff, right? And drinking it also br brings me back a lot of really pleasant memories of that great time. Um, and then we didn't have enough money for a very long time for me to enjoy very much fine scotch whiskey. And then like two months ago, I remembered, oh, ha, I can have whatever whiskey I want now. Well, now you'll um, like it more if you have it, like you'll savor it more mm -hmm. if it's just once every... I'm savoring the hell out of that. 
Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. All right. Well, on to the questions. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. What's your go-to meal when you don't feel like spending time in the kitchen? Um... That's most of the time. <laughs> uh, and I would say, I mean, like for Lauren, it's definitely pasta. Mm. Um, I, my love of pasta has decreased markedly over you know, the last few years. Um, well, I mean, to a certain extent, I think it's just my body responding and being like, <laughs> you know, no more carbs. No, stop. <laughs> no more down the hatch. We have enough, you know. Um, Yours is a steak. Yeah, so generally like a, you know, a piece of animal protein plus a vegetable, right? Um, Which, you know, can be such a convenient and just great bang for buck kind of meal. And I think one of the things that I have learned, and I, you know, I don't want to universalize my experience, but I think, you know, for a white kid growing up in America when I did, um, a meal, I was led to believe through... Um, how my parents, you know, fed us was a meat, a starch, and a veg. Like you were supposed to be kind of those three components on the plate. Was that, was it like that for you? Yeah. Yeah. A meat, a starch, and a veg, right? And I just kind of, I, I tried to kind of do that in a lot of my early years of cooking for myself. And then I kind of, at some point I realized, you know, it's amazing how much easier the whole thing gets when you just eliminate one of those, right? If you're not trying to produce three separate dishes for dinner, um, if you just do two, it's not, I, I think, I think it's more than just 33 and a third point, no, thir- 33.3333333 percent easier. Um, I think it's like more than that easier. It's just so much better. And I don't need any more starches in my life. So I generally make like a meat and a veg and it's fantastic. So yeah, steak and broccoli, something like that. All right. Hold on. Sorry. Mm. My, 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 my. Anyway, what are your favorite things about Macon and the surrounding area? Any must-see tips for people visiting? Interesting question, and I will try to answer it a little bit more directly in a moment, but one thing that I want to emphasize is I get like a lot of, you know, comments and people being like, oh, wow, this guy really likes Macon, Georgia. And I do. I like it here a lot, but here's why I'm always being like, Macon, 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 and Georgia, 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 and all of that. Um, I, I want, I want to be an advocate for all of the places that aren't New York and Tokyo and Los Angeles, right? Like I, the winner take all economy of cities is something that I think is terrible and has really made the planet worse. Um, there's so many wonderful places to live in the world and you know, back even when I was a local news reporter, like I had the same goal, you know, I wanted to. I wanted localism in media. Um, I wanted local flavor to media all the time because I wanted to just, you know, I just wanted more representation for the places that aren't the big media capitals. Um, So that's why I do that. It's not because like Macon, Georgia is the, is the capital of the culinary universe. Um, It's just one of many awesome places to live and to know about and to visit. Um, And also because it's, you know, I think for a long time, you know, New York really was the only good place to eat in the United States, right? Or, or, I mean, that's an overstatement, but you know what I'm getting at, right? Like, and now, you know, gastronomy has advanced so much that like in, you know, any city of more than, you know, 50,000 people or something like that, there's at least one really, really great restaurant. Um, And we have several, so, uh, you know, yay, yay to that. That's a good thing. In terms of Macon, Georgia specifically, like things to come and see, um, well, I suppose I have to kind of think of a different answer in the age of uh, social distancing. I mean, we have been enjoying so much of the kind of outdoor, you know, stuff. Um, Just me, I would just, I just take the kids on kind of day trips of things uh, natural beauty around here. Um, so one that's fantastic that has just reopened is the Okmulgee National, um, no, what's it called now? Mo- Okmulgee Mo- National Mo- Park and, pre- no. The Okmulgee National Historical Park, that's what it's called now. Sorry, Congress just changed the name. Okay, uh, so this is like, you know, by some archeologists reckoning, possibly the longest continuously inhabited place in the Americas. Um, it's like, so it's like, it's a place of what they call Indian mounds, right? So um, various waves of native peoples built 
earthworks here, like amazing, titanic, huge earthworks. And it's super beautiful and it's, the archaeology of it is cool and it's cool to kind of climb, even climb up the Great Temple Mound and that's awesome. But there's also just like really, really extensive nature walks and grounds and, and things. Um, you know, I just, it, it's so, cause it's like when we lived in Boston, it's like there, there, if there was a beautiful place, that would mean that you couldn't go there because it would be packed, right? And if people saw you there, they'd be like, oh God, another one, right? Whereas like here, there's all of these beautiful places and I'll show up and I'll be like, no one, I'll be like, wow, how is there no one here? Like, so we found this place in um, the Piedmont National Wildlife Preserve, I think is what it's called, um, which is just, you know, like 15 minutes from here. And it's a place that like the local rangers call the rocks. And it's just like this just flat table of a uh, rock over which a, a river flows or a stream flows. And it's just like, it's the most beautiful, pristine place. Um, and it's, it's massive and it, there's all kinds of little interesting things to explore. And if that was in the orbit of any major city, it would just be swamped with people all the time. And there'd be like guide rails because someone died and like, every, you know, it would just, it, it would, the, the fun would be ruined. But like, if you just, it's, you know, if you- Safety. Safety, <laughs> dumb safety. Well, I mean, another example of that is like, we have in Macon, there's a concrete slide. Um, so there's a f foundation called the, the, the Knight Foundation, which is, it's an old newspaper fortune. Um, and they support Macon a lot for historical reasons. And they had this thing called the Knight Neighborhood Challenge for this one area of downtown, where basically, you know, they were just like, hey, come up with your crazy idea to make this neighborhood better and we'll fund it. And somebody's crazy idea was, there's this big hill called Coleman Hill in downtown Macon, and it would be perfect for like a slide. Let's build a polished concrete slide that goes down Coleman it's like Hill. like a luge. <laughs> a luge, yeah, it's almost like a luge, for sure, yeah. And any other city, the lawyers would be like, no. <laughs> But here they're like, eh, you know, cause it's just, it's an underpopulated place. And so bring a piece of a cardboard box and go to Coleman Hill and go whooping down the yeah. slide. <laughs> I mean, in your, in your just clothes, it's fine. But if you really want to go suicidally fast, <laughs> go on a piece of cardboard, the, the Coleman Hill slide in, in downtown Macon, Georgia. And there's parking like right there. You know, if it was in a real city, like none of those spaces would ever be available. But like here you can park there anytime and it's right next to the slide and our friend Tim's house. You know, so like I, I'm not to to close the narrative loop, like I'm not just like shilling for Macon, Georgia. I'm shilling for just get out of whatever major metro bubble you may be in, because life really can be so much better in lots of ways outside. What's been a food craze that you either really loved or really hated? OK. Um, the answer to both of those is the same thing, which is the tabletop convection oven, which has a hip name that I refuse to say. The air fryer? I refuse to say it. <laughs> it's the air fryer. I refuse the table, <laughs> the tabletop convection oven phrase, uh, phase, uh, not phrase, craze. There it is. <laughs> Three sips in. Um, I've also been on a diet, so this is gonna hit me like, whoa, all right? Um, it's the tabletop convection oven. So I hate the name, right? Because it feels like a marketing term from like 20 years ago when people were still laboring under the misconception that dietary fat was the biggest problem with their diet as opposed to the carbohydrates. And dietary fat can be bad for your diet, but like probably in my diet and the diet of most people watching this, the carbohydrates are probably the bigger problem, right? Um, so it's like, oh, it's a way to fry without oil, right? Is how it, that, that, what that name implies and how some of the market, explicit marketing actually like says that, right? And that's just dumb, right? The oil isn't the problem, okay? Um, and also, by the way, like deep frying versus coating something in oil and then cooking it in an oven, I'm not sure there's much of a like dietary fat savings there. It's coated in oil either way, right? I mean, it would tend, it depends on the specifics, but that's, you know, I'm not the first person to observe that, right? So um, I'm really annoyed by the marketing and all of that. Um, on the other hand, when our kitchen was being redone and we had no oven, Lauren uh, went rogue 
and ordered a tabletop convection oven, which is right over there. And it's like the best thing. <laughs> like I, you know, right now we mostly just use it for super pretzels, which are like the, you know, the frozen like soft pretzels, which like they are amaze balls when they come out of that thing. Or for dino nuggets, um, <laughs> which are also super good out of that thing. Frozen French, ba okay, look, Fro I know yeah. everyone's like, well, what's your, what are your air fryer recipes? There were several people who asked that, but the fact of the matter is we use our air fryer mostly to reheat fried junk food. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, dude, like you've never French fries from an <laughs> French fries from a restaurant, like take out French fries that have gotten like soggy and cold inside the box. You can put them in this thing and they taste like they're fresh out of the freaking fryer. It's insane. You've also never had like a Totino's pizza roll or oh, bagel bite yeah. as good. As, yeah. Like, they come alive in the air fryer. <laughs> and it's this kind of thing where it's like, you, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, this is how ovens would have evolved had the technology for fans existed and had the family structure been what it is now. Household sizes are way smaller now than they were back in, when the enclosed Rumford oven um, you know, came to prominence in the market, right? Um, Households used to be multi-generational multi places where like mom, dad, and grandpa and eight kids are like living. And so naturally you have a bigger oven to kind of cook for those people, right? Um, family size, household sizes rather, are much smaller nowadays. And so it doesn't really make sense to heat up something so enormous to cook a dinner for two or three people or one person if you're living alone, right? Um, so I kind of think that the tabletop convection oven is like the future and it hurt, it pains me to say that given everything I led with. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm planning a lot more experiments with it and I imagine quite a few tabletop convection oven recipes are coming. And that is how I will refer to them. It's an air fryer. Tabletop <laughs> convection oven. I just want you all to know that he calls it an air fryer when he's not on camera. <laughs> I care about the influence that I have on my mass audience. I, I take that seriously. Because you're an influencer. Because I'm an influencer. <laughs> Other than salt, what's one spice you couldn't live without? Wow. This is hard. I was thinking about it and I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's going to be garlic powder, right? I just think it's such an underappreciated, unfairly maligned product that is so convenient and is so good at so many things. And the only reason people don't like it is A, maybe they're just expecting it to be fresh garlic, which it's not. It's like expecting a dried mushroom to be a fresh mushroom. They're just two totally different things, both incredible, you know? Or, I mean, what I suspect maybe it is, is just kind of like it's garlic powder's association with kind of very day class A, food of the 20th century, like upper Midwestern ladies and their casseroles and their dips, right? Certainly like I have that association with onion powder, like onion powder to me tastes like, um, what's that dip? Uh, artichoke, the artichoke dip? Spinach artichoke spinach, dip? Spinach, yeah, spinach artichoke dip, like which is in bound in sour cream or cream cheese or something like that. And it usually has like a lot of you know, garlic and onion powder in it. And like I associate onion powder with that stuff and that's just a purely cultural association that like maybe will die with my generation. Um, but both of those things are really good products. Are you ever going to travel to other countries for food? Mm. <laughs> An apropos question. Yeah, so you should know that, here I'm just making sure that, ah, this thing. Um, just making sure my thing was still recording. I. Uh, my plan, my business plan really had been to at this point be traveling for like every other video. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not super interested in my own recipes <laughs> and I'm sure that your interest in my recipes is limited, right? Um, but then global plague happened, right? And it's kind of irresponsible to travel places and irresponsible to be in small enclosed places with people and pinning lavalier microphones on them. And 
So, yeah. So, you know, that's, I mean, everyone, again, another thing, like I was like, you know, I do, I've done lots of videos lately that are about, like I did a video about the history of Georgia peaches and people are like, wow, <laughs> this guy really loves Georgia. It's like, well, it's more that like, I can't go anywhere and I'm trying to think creatively about what I can do with what I have where I am, right? How long do you typically take to research your videos? Um, so I assume you're talking about the Monday videos that are videos that are not recipes, but they are about food. Um, it depends, but those are, those are very labor intensive. Those, those have gotten to be very hard. Um, and so those are generally many, many weeks in advance, I start working on them. I mean, a, a month at least, usually. Um, planting the seeds, thinking about what I'm gonna do, and um, putting out some feelers about people I could talk to, uh, you know, combing through scientific literature when necessary. Uh, so I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't put like a, an, a, 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 um, an hour figure on it. But, um, but yeah, those are generally at least a month in the making these days. Related. Do you see yourself as more of a chef or a journalist? Mm. I am not a chef in any way. Um, I'm, a, I'm a person who cooks a lot, but I am absolutely not a chef, never been a chef. A chef, a chef is a job title, right? It's, it means the leader of a kitchen um, or someone within the leadership structure of a, of a kitchen, right? Um, and th that is not something that I have ever been or ever really want to be. Um, so no, I, I, I am a person who cooks. I'm a journalist who cooks. That's what I am. If you were given a million dollars right now, what would you spend it on? So my first instinct is to say, give it to various charities. Um, we've been doing a whole lot of giving lately um, because I think when the world is going a little bit uh, nuts, uh, money is usually more valuable than speech from people like me. Um, so I probably would, but like an honest answer would be, um, we just found out that true to my suspicions, I cannot get a mortgage despite making a really excellent living thanks to you at the moment. Uh, but basically like you have to make that excellent living for multiple years, multiple tax years before a bank will take you seriously nowadays, which I suppose I appreciate the caution, but yeah, like I, like despite like having like a fair about of money uh, at the moment. Like, yeah, I, I could not get a home loan right now. And, you know, I, you know, we're in no rush to move. I mean, we love it here in this house and this kitchen, obviously fantastic. Um, but, you know, our, our children are rapidly expanding and uh, this, <laughs> this is a, a very small house, you know, so uh, we'll have to make that leap at some point. So yes, probably would just pay cash for a house. Or um, with a million dollars, I think I will buy land and build my dream house. Really? You would do like new construction? I mean, really? just to get, I mean, if, if I had, if money was no object, I guess, I mean, million dollars. I feel like if money was no object, I'd be more inclined to like restore some uh, I guess faded glory property. That's true. That's true. Um, hmm. yeah. Either way. We sound like assholes. <laughs> Couple of a-holes. <laughs> take, so, take that out. I'm leaving that in. Oh God. Um, okay. Oh, I'm asking this question because I'm curious how you'll answer. <laughs> how did you and Lauren meet? Didn't we already do this? Not really. We met on the internet. We met on Live Journal. <laughs> Sit down by the fire, children, and let me tell you the tales of Live Journal. Um, yeah. There was a Bloomington, Indiana Live Journal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is when I was riding my bicycle a lot. Um, and I weighed 60 pounds less than I weigh right now. When we first uh, met, you wore women's jeans in a size six. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they were boot cut women's jeans in a size six. And now I looked fantastic. Sure, you look great now. But... What's funny about that is, I mean, at the time, I think I was like a two or something stupid. And now I would commit crimes to fit into the pants you were wearing when you and I met. Well, it was a result But children of, rearranged my skeleton, yeah, so that's just not going to happen. Whole thing. And, and I have no excuse whatsoever. Um, 
Uh, but uh, no, that was the result of many, many, many miles biked on a bicycle, which it was, it was, you know, Bloomington, Indiana, for people who don't know, is a major cycling capital. There's a fantastic movie called Breaking Away that's all about this that you should like run, not walk, go see if you're remotely interested in cycling um, or Indiana um, and uh, or sports or like feelings. Like, it's a good sports movie. It's just movie. a great sports movie. Um, so anyways, uh, I think we the ostensible reason for our meeting was that we were going to go on a ride. Mm-hmm. Um, Not a euphemism. <laughs> because we were going to go out on a bike together because all my, like I had just graduated and all my friends had moved away. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know anybody still in, well... I didn't know that many people still in town, so I was trying to like meet some people who still live there. Yeah. And uh, but I wasn't gonna like ride off on my bike into the woods with a strange guy. Yeah. <laughs> so we were meeting first. Yes. In public. Yes. Where I mean, people were. And we our first date was at a Tibetan restaurant. Mm-hmm, little there Tibet. were not one but two Tibetan restaurants in Macon, Georgia. Bloomington, it Indiana. Was, I'm sorry, <laughs> Bloomington, Indiana. Um, in Bloomington, Indiana, and it was not Little Tibet. So that What's was fu- the second date. The oh, first date was Snow the other Lion. one, Snow, Snow Lion, Lion, which was not as good as Little Tibet. Our second date was at the other, <laughs> other it was at Tibet. Tibet. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah we went from one Tibetan restaurant to the second, yeah. and we had better luck at Little Tibet. Yeah. You didn't like me the first night. Better luck in more ways than one. Yeah. Way better restaurant. Little Tibet, Bloomington, Indiana. Got to go there. Their, okay, well, their so, salad dressing is crazy good. It is good. Somebody asked um, favorite restaurant in Bloomington. So. Oh, God, there's so many. I mean. Little Tibet is certainly my Certainly Little favorite. Tibet you got to put there. Uh, what's the. T- the um, um, farm. Farm is great. Yeah. The, the, is it Thai that's across from Little Tibet? What's the one across the street in the white Victorian? Isan Thai, was that it? No, Siam. Siam. Isan Thai was the one th- was the one that was over, you know, further down Kirkwood. Oh, okay. Bloomington, Indiana, for those that don't know, has like a stupid concentration of Fourth Street. Gotta amazing, go to Fourth Street. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. We had our um, rehearsal dinner at an Afghani restaurant mm-hmm. that was so good. Yes. Uh, Samira? Yes. Is that it? Uh, for people who don't know, in the United States, and I imagine this tr- tradition dates from Europe in some way, descends from Europe, um, there's a tradition to have a big dinner with a whole bunch of people the night before the wedding, and this is called the rehearsal dinner, and it's traditionally paid for by the groom's family, whereas the the wedding is paid for by the bride's family. And so anyway, so my dad, like, you know, paid for uh, this dinner at Samira, this fantastic Afghani place in, on the courthouse square in Bloomington, Indiana. And he said, like, well, you know, what do you want? And I was like, I don't know. And he said, like, you know, what's your, what's your, like, fantasy? Like, what would, you know, what would just, if you could just have anything? I said, I want, like, a whole roast beast, like a whole goat or something <laughs> like that. And that's exactly what they did. And it was awesome. Yeah, that was really fun. Yeah. That was good. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other places. In Bloomington? Yeah. Well, uh, Bloomington Bagel. So Bloomington Bagel Company. Yeah. It's this lady who came from New York and so she knows from good bagels and boy, They're the best bagels I've ever so had outside good, of yeah. New York. They're so, ugh. so good. Um, and then, uh, so we mentioned Little Tibet. I mean, Laughing Planet. I've already oh, hit, hit yeah. them in a video before, but uh, Laughing Planet is this burrito place, a San Francisco style burrito place. Just, just, just wonderful. Um, and then there's this really funny, um, it's a place called Yonko's Little Zagreb. Jonko's Little Zagreb, did they pronounce the J? No one ever, everyone just called it Little Zagreb. Little Zagreb. Jonko's Little mm-hmm. Zagreb. Um, it's just a steakhouse. <laughs> um, Zagreb being the Except it looks... capital of Croatia. I don't know. Someplace in the Balkans, sorry. It looks like a hole in the wall, and when you walk in, it's like picnic tables covered in red and white checks. Tablecloths, but it, then you order a very expensive yeah, steak. Yeah, a sixty dollars steak. The yeah. best steak you've ever had. Yeah, and they did all the meat. Like the smell of meat just pumped out of that restaurant. Yeah. And you, we lived across, across the way from yeah. in, from this place in a and building so in called the, the Mercury. Winter, it just smelled oh, like God. beef. I would be walking <laughs> back from class in the dead of winter, and there would just be beef smoke billowing out of this place that I could not afford. Um, but yeah, it's this terrific steakhouse. They dry age everything in the basement. Um, I do, I will say, I remember having like a funny rev- revelation when I was there one time where I was like, God, like this beef, it's like so, it's so milky. 
Like, is it the dry aging that gives it this kind of milky flavor? And then I went over to the grill and I see this dude ladling on clarified butter. <laughs> Like, oh, well, that'd do it, wouldn't it? Um, there's not, not that there's anything wrong with that, okay? Just, you know, butter and beef or a match made in heaven. Um, it's a great place. And it's like the place that, like, you know, when Indiana University is, like, trying to recruit, you know, football and basketball players, they take them there to try to knock their socks off and everything. And it's, but it's, that's a, ter that's a terrific place. Um, God, so I mean, for, just go to for, Fourth Street. Mm -hmm. in also, downtown I don't Macon, know if it's Georgia. still there because we haven't. Yeah, been, it to Bloomington, Indiana. God damn it. <laughs> we haven't been to Bloomington since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, Restaurant talent? No, I don't really remember that. That was a really good. I mean, there's there's like a James Beard Award oh, nominated at right. least. Maybe they've won in the years since I've left. Like fine dining place called Restaurant Talent there. That's super good. Um, I was going to say La Petite Cafe. Oh, La Petite Cafe. Oh, my I don't know God. if it's still there, but... I, last I checked, it was. So La Petite Cafe is like these two, this, this French couple who, I don't know how they settled in Bloomington, Indiana. I think they were, one of them was a French professor. Oh, really? Anyway, the guy come. they just like write the food up on the chalkboard menu. And then when you sit down, the guy, the owner, he comes and sits down at your table and he like tells you what we have tonight. Yeah. And then he like. There's you, three things on the menu. Yeah. Right? And, like, and you order, yeah. there's always cheese pastry. Um, yeah. And you can get a glass, uh, a, a, a carafe or a half carafe of yeah. red or white. That's, yeah. Those are your choices. Yeah. And the food is like, it doesn't there's come out looking spectacular, but it tastes amazing. I know. So, and it's like, it's this little, it's right on this rail spur that is now a, the like a rails to trails trail. Yeah. So it's a, a walking trail called the Beeline Trail, but it's, it's this old railroad building. So, you know, um, buildings that were meant, that were built to service rail, rail lines often have really weird geometry, right? Because they're sort of built right up against the rail. And then, so it's this really weird little trapezoidal kind of building, but it's their house, you know, the front of it is like eight tables in their restaurant and the back of it is their house. And they have been doing that for like 30, 40 years. And it's like how... Can you imagine a better, a bigger win on life than what those people have lived? Um, you just went on a major trip down memory lane. Yeah. Somebody asked at some point about, would we move back to Bloomington? Like, absolutely, yeah, if it didn't cost 11 bajillion dollars to live downtown. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you keep clicking, I can afford it. <laughs> It's just it's just really far away from our family, which is like the main thing. Yeah, and also, also like winter. I, yeah, <laughs> winter. Like I'm, it's I don't know how I could handle. I don't know how I would handle winter, having been so free of it for so long. <laughs> All right, back to the cooking question. Sure. Yeah, let's get a little more of the the Glenmorangie. Would you? I'm sure that I mispronounced that just then. Isn't it Glenmorangie? Either way. Colin, my agent, is Colin, is going to be very mad for two, for not one but two reasons. One, because I mispronounced the whiskey. Two, because I just gave an endorsement uncompensated. <laughs> Would you ever make a cookbook? Yes, um, if I could find the right way to do it. And I, I've been approached by lots of people about doing cookbooks, which is great. It's great to be in that position. And none of those has felt like the right thing to, to do. Um, I, you know, publishing is also really hard. <laughs> public publishing is a hard business, as my novelist wife, Lauren Morrill, knows. Pre-order um, my next book. <laughs> pre -order your ne it's a pizza book. It's about pizza. It is. Um, well, well you'll, you'll, you'll hear more about that later. Um, but anyways, um, I, I am of the feeling that if you're going to do a cookbook, it needs to not just be a collection of like good recipes and pretty pictures, right? Um, because, you know... Who needs a book for that, right? There's the internet. Um, it has to be a physical object that is has intrinsic value as an object, you know? So it's got to be something that, like, has, you know, laminated pages that won't... Um, you can splatter sauce on them and it won't hurt them. It has to lay flat, right? Uh, or, or stand up, right? And, like, a, you know, a genius idea that Lauren has had is, like, 
you know, make like a, a box of recipe cards like your grandma had. Like I could like make that with all of my recipes and, you know, I, it, some, some kind of idea like that. And the reason that none of those ideas has panned out is that it's like, that would be tremendously expensive to manufacture, right? So, um, you know, I've, I've had a conversation recently with a, with a small publisher who um, might be game for such an idea and I need to get back to that person. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like the more likely scenario for that, I mean, I think a project like that will happen eventually, but it'll probably be done in a, an unconventional business model, right? Where like you, uh, you know, maybe com you know, more like a GoFundMe kind of, um, you know, kind of startup model, right? Where like Kickstarter, Kickstarter, sorry, Kickstarter rather, a Kickstarter kind of model where like you tell me that you're interested in paying, you know, a lot for a book, you know, maybe, you know, 70 bucks or something like that for a book. Is that a lot? Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's gonna be a lot, right? To like give you something that's not just a cookbook, but is this kind of awesome made object that is special, you know? And so- A million dollars. A million, <laughs> one million dollars. Um, yeah. I also think that you should do like a food science book for kids. I think that I, I would be, I mean, and that's something cool... that I would be very comfortable doing with traditional publishing because that could just be a book hmm. or a board book. All children's books should be board books. Why aren't they? Because they're expensive. That's why. Probably. And you can't have that many pages. In a I book. wish that like all books, like even grown up books were board books. <laughs> Cause like I have a lot of trouble turning pa like thin paper pages, like my hand cramps. I just don't like okay, it. This Whereas is board <laughs> books, they just, Oh man, it's so easy. A couple people asked, um, if you had any book recommendations and somebody asked specifically what your favorite of my books is, <laughs> I wasn't going to ask, but if we're going to talk about your delicate fingers with turning pages, Adam's not a big reader. Well, I am a big reader. I'm not a big reader of books. And there are two reasons for that. <laughs> Yes, they're legitimate. Okay, legitimate so first reasons. of all, I am lisdexic, okay? <laughs> um, diagnosed when I was a kid. I did not read until I was stupid old. Um, oh. You know, and like if you ever wonder why, like, there's lots of misspellings in either the captions or like the, the descriptions where I write out the recipes, like, I, spelling is a major struggle for me to this day. Um, and reading. Oh my God. What? There's a raccoon. It just climbed up on the roof. I just saw it. Oh my God. Did, little, did you see it? I don't know. But it's no, no, little, I'm asking them. Did they see it? I know. Its little tail just went up. I was like, is that a cat? Nope, raccoon. There's a Let's raccoon on the roof. Let's eat it. Let's eat it. With taters. Oh, little trash panda. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Sorry to derail the conversation. <laughs> I just looked over your shoulder and I was like, there is an animal climbing up onto the roof. <laughs> oh my God. So there's, there's a fan who has been doing time codes for the Ask Adams, and <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing how you time code that. <laughs> and thank you for your service. Um, what the fuck were we talking about? You, you don't read. <laughs> I don't read, yeah. So anyway, like, I read, but like reading is much more effort for me than I think it is for you, and certainly for you, right? Um, it's, it requires a level of concentration and kind of, you know, just mental effort and... And so like reading is not something I do for recreation because it's hard and it gives me headaches and I have to, you know, whereas like you, it just, it just blows right off the page. So yeah. <laughs> um, it sucks because um, there's all kinds of literature that I would love to get to, but like it, it hurts my brain. <laughs> so not a big reader. And also, yes, I don't, I really like that. I have a, a profound negative tactile response to book paper paper, right? I just, it feel like when I touch it, I feel like it's like sucking all of the moisture out of my thumb and it just, you know, it freaks me out. It's a testament to my love for you that it doesn't bother me when you say things like, books are so heavy. It Holding them up you. is hard. It does bother you. No, I mean, at this point. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I mean, I've just given up on happiness. So. <laughs> no, I mean, you are who you are and it's... <laughs> there's there's all this rhetoric about like uh you know there's that John Waters quote about like if somebody doesn't have books don't fuck them and John Waters from Pink Floyd yeah no the wait no what's his name the guy from uh, oh the the filmmaker yeah yeah, yeah. yes sorry and um, Roger Waters is the one from yes no, I think oh god I don't know anyway Just digging the hole deeper at this point anyway yes but 
mustache guy. Yeah. And yeah. then like, you know, in all my, my writing communities, people always talk about like, oh, my partner and their reading of my books and it's so important to me what they think. And I'm just like, you know what? That there's more, like there's not one way to be and it is not a fatal flaw if you're not into reading fiction. For what it's worth, I would be much more comfortable if you never watched a single one of my videos, my vidyas. I don't watch them all, but I, I watch I, a lot of them. Yes, and I wish you didn't. Oh, so, really? <laughs> yes. So. Oh. There's Why? The, there's the other side of that coin. Why? I, this, my, my, my work is over here. My life is over here. Oh. But see, I watch them because they're entertaining. I know, but then you talk about them and I'm like, my home! <laughs> You're bringing it into my home! Into my bedroom where my wife sleeps. <laughs> where my children come and play with their toys. Oh my god. This Ask Adam has gone very off the rails. <laughs> oh my. Where it's, am I? It's the, it's, the, it's the whiskey. God, it's so good. For the record, I what? watch it's your videos because they're entertaining. Oh, thank they, you. Like, a lot of times they make me laugh. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um... Would you ever consider competing on Hell's Kitchen, and I will add, a or any other reality not. show? <laughs> absolutely not. Correct um, answer. <laughs> for several reasons. I mean, one, it would just be a terrible life choice. Two, like, I'm, I'm philosophically opposed to that crap. Like, I, I think the idea of cooking as a competition is, is toxic. But you like um, Bake Off. The Great British Bake Off? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's because that's an anti-competition yeah. show, right? Or at least it was in it's the original a, version of it I mean, it, it still is. Watched. There's still a winner and people get kicked off, but it's all very pleasant. Yeah, and... exactly. Um, no, I mean, the whole... I mean, like, and I have, like, you know, sometimes, you know, people on, like, the Twitters or whatever will, you know, challenge me to a cook-off or something like that. And I'm like, do... No, Stop. It's not about, it's not a dick measuring contest. It's your dinner. Like, just, you should make something that makes you happy in the time that you have to allot to it and then move the fuck on with your life, okay? That's what cooking is supposed to be about. It's supposed to serve you. You're not supposed to serve it, okay? And just the whole idea of like cooking as being an expression of one's prowess is everything I am against, of everything that I work to combat. Um, and so, no, I mean, I'm opposed to those programs on a philosophical level, and I will not engage with Except them. Except for you and I used to watch Top Chef way back in the beginning. Yeah. Before we had TiVo, and during the commercial breaks, we would try to run down from the apartment into the convenience store to get snacks, and then back before the show started. Kids, let me tell you about the days of television, and you couldn't pause it. <laughs> Gather around the fire. Old Man Ragusea has a story for you. Oh, we're a thousand. Um, okay, what's one thing you cannot stand eating but wish you could? Oh, beets, easily. Really? I yeah. was going to say sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, oh, that's a good one too. So I'll, I'll talk you, about both You of try really hard to like sweet potatoes. Yeah, I did. I mean, and sweet I potatoes them. are so, they're so good and they're so nutritious. Like they're so much better for you than potatoes. Um, sweet potato is actually not a potato, right? It's like, botanically, it's a totally different thing. And, um, and there's, I mean, they're just, in terms of their position on the glycemic index and everything, like they're just, they're so good for you. And um, I, you know, at, I think it was when I was doing more kind of, it wasn't when I was cycling, it was when I was more kind of bodybuilding that I was trying to eat a lot of sweet potatoes. And the way that I was, I was able to make them reasonably palatable to myself was um, putting chipotle peppers in them with a lot of the adobo sauce from the can. And that's, that's good. I mean, that's like, do that. Mash sweet potatoes with chipotle peppers in them. And that's, that's hella good, okay? But I still hated it. I just, I don't know what it is. I just, I just don't like them, and which sucks because I would love to like them because they're so good for you. Um, and I looked good while I was eating them. <laughs> uh, not anymore. Um, but... Uh, Would you please stop making fun of, like, denigrating yourself? Yes, I know. That's right. That's not, that's not enlightening. You're a handsome fella. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I, and then beets. Yeah, beets are, they're beautiful and sweet and they have a great crunch to them and they come in so many colors and there's so many things you can do with them and they just, they, the, the very smell of them turns my stomach and it's, you know, it's probably like a, an acquired thing from childhood. My parents, who had a huge, wonderful garden growing up that I never appreciated, except for the sweet corn. And by the way, that's like another thing that like, another way in which we were a thousand is like, you know, I, when I was a child, the only way to get sweet corn that was really sweet was to grow it or to go down to a farm stand where they had picked it a few hours before. Because the thing about sweet corn, at least naturally, is that as soon as you pick it, the sugars in it start to convert to starch. Um, starch are sugars that are so big that your, your tongue doesn't perceive them as, as sweet, right? Um, but your, your belly perceives them. Um, so, uh, but like, you know, uh, cor sweet corn breeders have fixed that problem. Like there's now all kinds of sweet corn on the market that like you can pick it days, probably weeks before um, you cook it and it's still very, very sweet. But that's like an innovation that occurred during my, uh, mostly my adult lifetime, right? Um, what was I talking about? Oh, my parents had this wonderful garden and I didn't appreciate anything in it other than the sweet corn. And they also grew beets and they, they pickled them. And just, just you know, putting pickled beets in front of a kid and saying, you have to eat this. And if you don't eat it, you're gonna go straight to bed. That just, you know, my parents were wonderful people and they did all kinds of things right, but I think that that was, that was a mistake and I've tried to learn from that and how we feed we've, our own kids. We probably, there were lots of questions We probably about, overcompensated. Yeah, there were lots of questions about how do you handle picky eaters or what would you do if you had a picky eater? Well, friends, yeah. we have a picky eater. And the answer is I don't know and... No I, one can really tell us. <laughs> yeah, and it's like I, I'm so... I have... So we have, one of our children is a very picky eater. Like it's a pathology. It's so severe, right? And um, I have... You know, and I'm, I'm, I've tried to seek treatment, right? But like, I can't find anyone who I think has like an evidence-based approach to this. It's all folk wisdom. Most, I, like- I'm not paying $200 an hour for folk wisdom, okay? And like, um, you know, his pediatrician is like, his blood work is fine and he's all healthy and he's growing and he'll grow out of it and fingers crossed. I mean, I was a marginally picky eater growing up. I grew out of it. Yeah. My brother was a super picky eater growing up. He grew out of it. He didn't grow up until it was like his 30s, you know? Well, later. Late 20s, but, you know? Yeah. I mean, he worked in restaurants, so that helped. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I think we're just doing the best we can and keeping them fed and making sure they're healthy and yeah. growing and, you know, offering, always offering and trying not to make it a punishment. If anyone in the audience <laughs> has like, an, if this is an area of research specialty for you, um, please get in touch with me. I would love to do a video about picky eating. That would be great. Um, oh my gosh. But I have, like, I've been scouring scientific literature. I haven't found anything like, you know, it's so, yeah. So if you have a picky eater, you were one of the people that was asking that question. Solidarity, friend. Yeah, solidarity. It's hard. It's really hard because you tell yourself before you have kids, like, oh well, yeah, I'm just we're gonna sit down to dinner every night, and I'm only gonna make one thing, and, yeah. blah, 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 and blah, blah, they're blah, gonna blah. eat kale and like it. There yeah. is nobody more confident than a person who does not yet have mm, a child. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Um, the thing is, when they come out, they're their own people, and there's nothing you can do about who they are. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, solidarity. It's really frustrating, yeah. but we'll get there someday. All right, um, let's try to blast through. I mean, there, we've well, got two more minutes left. Two more fun questions. Okay, two more fun. Are there some not fun questions? No, no, no. Two more questions, and they're fun. I think. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite Hall and Oates song? Mm. So many. I love Hall and Oates. Um, I will mention two. One is Possession Obsession. Which is a freaking great song. One of the few later Holland Oates songs on which Oates sang lead, um, and it's just he just crushes it. Um, he sounds like Prince, and he was so he was so underutilized. I mean, I understand why he was underutilized because, you know, um, Daryl Hall has like like a once in a generation instrument, you know, um, but John Oates is a pretty special guy too, and boy, he just crushes that song. And, uh, and the, but the other one is like an early, like an early jam and one that people don't know about a lot. It's called It's a Laugh and it's a Daryl Hall song. Um, and such a good song. Such a good group. God. God. <laughs> Love Hall Star Wars or Star Trek? 
So I'm certainly like a Trek man all day long. Um, people who... Put Star Wars all night. <laughs> Star Wars all night. <laughs> Star Trek in front, Star Wars in the back. Yikes. <laughs> uh, no, I... I mean, I, you know, I, I, I love Star Trek The Next Generation. It's my favorite television series, television series. Um, I love the intellectualism. I love the optimism, everything that people love about classic Trek. He also likes that it's very slow. Yeah, exactly. Nothing so, happens. Exactly. Like the thing about, and it's, it's really about Next Generation particularly. Like this is not true of any of the Star Trek series. I love the aspect of like a bunch of people sitting at a conference. <coughs> A bunch of people sitting at a conference table and having a rational, intelligent, long conversation about how to fix a relatively low stakes problem and respecting each other and loving each other in the process instead of having a whole bunch of conflict because people who went to screenwriter school were taught, you need conflict. You do. You don't. <laughs> Freaking love that. And I love Captain Picard is a totally almost uncomplicated um, uh, you know male and leadership role model um, you know almost perfect Adam wanted um, us to name our first child John Luke yeah I totally would have done that Vito. totally would have done that Vito <laughs> <laughs> um, I got him a onesie that looked like Captain Picard's uniform and yes, that was enough <laughs> that's right and he fit in it for like a month <laughs> um so yes, Trek all day long, and in particular TNG. Um, and people who know my, you know, done their deep dive on me, like I, I have an association with a a, um, a, a a property of various Star Trek podcasts known as the Greatest Generation, Greatest Discovery, um, and f for whom I've composed music over the years. Um, those podcasts that are shockingly popular podcasts. Um, that said, I, I like Star Wars. Um, I think that I think that the original trilogy is is fantastic for all of the reasons that people love it. Mostly the clothes. Like seriously, I'm sorry. The costumes are freaking killer in the first in Star Wars: A New Hope. Like, I mean, in the same way that you don't really care for books, I'm just not a sci-fi person. Okay. I respect and recognize that in you, and I love it. I'm sure that you can respect and recognize um, Harrison Ford in those chaps that he was wearing. And sure, Harrison yeah. Ford's costume, yes. Harrison Ford, he can get fashion <laughs> wise, is who I want to be. Like, there's this, there's a picture. Maybe if I have time, I will put it on the screen right now. But otherwise, go out and look for it. Um, it is there's this picture of Harrison Ford at Can Con. Um, in like 1979 or something like that. And he has just stopped, stepped off a boat and he's got like those fantastic late 70s, early 80s short shorts. Like men used to wear short shorts and they freaking owned it and it looked awesome. Short shorts on this guy and he's got like his shades and he's got like a, a uh, what do you call it? A, a sweatshirt on, like shorts with a sweatshirt because he's been on a boat, you know? And it's that combination of hot and cold that you only get on a boat. Um, and I just, how he looks in that picture is how I want to look and feel and live my whole life. And never will, right? Just please don't pierce your ear. I'm not going to pierce my ear and I'm not going to date Calista Flockhart. They're married. Oh, really? Yeah, they have oh, a kid. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm not going to, you know. Oh, Adam also does not keep up with celebrity gossip. <laughs> and I'm not going to make freaking jingoistic, propagandistic, you know, G America get off my plane films. Okay? Oh, that's a good movie. That you is not a good it. movie. That is not okay, a good movie. Okay, it is problematic, but it is also a good movie. <laughs> um, but like how Harrison Ford looks in that picture is how I want to look and feel and live all the time. And also in his costume in original Star Wars is freaking killer. I would love to look and dress like that all the time. There's so many bugs in this kitchen now. And it's causing a huge problem in <laughs> shooting food. Well, it's because the back door gets left open now when the kids go in the backyard. Uh, we got to work on that. We got to work on that. What was the question? Oh, Star Wars and Star Trek. So anyway, <laughs> but here's the reason. Here's the thing. I have not watched the original trilogy in a long time, and I have not shown it to my children. Why? Because George Lucas destroyed them, and I refuse to show my children the George Lucas destroyed editions of, of Star Wars. 
And you know, if and when um, the like legacy editions are released, which will probably be after George Lucas dies or when he runs out of money and needs to find another way of getting it, right? Um, then I will show my children Star Wars and I will watch Star Wars again. But until then, no. Cannot countenance what George Lucas did to his films. And for what it's worth, like I have tried to kind of, in my own extraordinarily minor fame, I have tried to learn from George Lucas's example about what not to do. And like to recognize that like when you put things out into the world, if people like them, they become, those creations of yours become much bigger than you and you do not own them anymore, right? And so I might not like the videos of mine that have been the, the, the most successful, but who cares? It's not mine anymore, it's yours. And there's nothing I can do about that and I just need to shut up and let the world be as it is. Last question. Uh, that was the last question, unless you want to talk about your workout routine. I don't. You don't want to tell everybody about how much you love the Peloton now? <laughs> Colin's going to get mad. No uncompensated endorsements for very well-to-do companies. We already got a Peloton. <laughs> we paid for it, to be um, perfectly clear. So thank you for watching. Um, w one little program note I'd like to offer is that so um, whenever I talk about uh, dietary changes that I need to make for my own welfare, uh, a lot of people ask like, well, why do you keep like putting out like, you know, cookie recipes and stuff? Like, aren't you trying to, aren't you trying to fix your body? Um, you know, fundamentally, I mean, I, I try to make things on the channel that I like because, you know, I don't, I have no other way of gauging whether or not a recipe is good. Um, but also be aware that in the end, I'm making it for you, right? So like I'm working on a brownie recipe, for example, that like, you know, I'll probably do soon. Um, and you know, it's, it's for you, not for me. Um, I and need for to, me. And, and for Laura, <laughs> yeah. I need to cut back um, and uh, just because quarantine's been rough. Um, and, uh, but uh, just be aware that that's a thing that's going on. And fundamentally, the videos are they're for you, more so than for me. Um, and, uh, and this one's for you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.